Isn't this one an instrumental? This one is an instrumental. I mean, there's yeah. some singing on it, but basically an instrumental. It's bad. Y'all watch yeah. this one live. It's Sturm, uh, Daner's doing the simple kick rip. And Phil's doing all the fills. Phil's doing the fills. Brand X song. Oh yeah. I think. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't remember there being any Saxon Brand X, but there definitely could have been. I, I haven't listened. To, you know, I, I may be imagining that. Very rhythmic and instrumental. Fusion feel. Right. Fusion. Right. By Brand X. Don Myrick, sax. Here we go. Oh, not yet. Another, another verse here. Like, okay, I'm gonna hold a shot right there. Those those Taurus pedals. Man, Phil can Phil can jam. He can, he can jam. 
you know, on those drums. And I just kind of like, this is a good Loser. Editor. Yeah. It is. It's very soft. It's kind like, of the... Let's, let's go to... Let's just go to bed. It's the lullaby. It's kind of the end of the day. Of the... I just don't argue anymore. Just... Why yeah. for the Tarzan album in 2000 for Disney. So I knew he had some Disney connections there. It, it wasn't Lion King. It was Tarzan. Yeah, I was yeah. Lion King, but yeah, Tarzan, right? Here's a... Yeah, here's he wrote a... Go ahead. Here's a trivial thing. He is one of only three recording artists who have sold over 100 million records, both as a solo artist and as a member of a band. Oh. You know the other two? Oh, one of three. Well, Paul McCartney, yeah. probably. And the other... Um, Pop King. Michael Jackson. Right. Yeah. Jack Jackson that's, Jackson Five and yep. So that's Phil. Phil Collins. Paul McCartney. Phil Collins, Michael, Michael Jackson. Jackson, and Paul McCartney. <laughs> yeah, yep. That's I our believe film, it, man. man. <laughs> that's our Phil. You know? The dude who just last week, one week ago, sang his first lead you know, yeah, on a on a song, on an album. And then that was in 76. Six years later, he's doing this and yeah. is on the verge of just becoming six years. You know, pop king, man. Six years. Six years. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. And really, if you think about it, you know, because they started, I mean, those two albums with Hackett weren't big commercial things. But once, then there were three, had Follow You, Follow Me, which became a pretty big commercial hit. And Duke yep. with uh, Misunderstanding. Turn It On Again. Turn It On Again. Yeah, Misunderstanding. Big, yep, yep. So that's really it's yep. it's about and then two, Abigab, or, right? two or three years he really became huge. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Yep. Well, I mean, it is. It was you know <laughs> that whole. I think the transition was really psychological for him, right? It, the, yeah, he goes out that first show of the Trick of the Tail tour, and he's got notes, and he's nervous as heck, and he can't. Even, he's like afraid he's gonna completely bomb, right? right. And. 
you know, it, it doesn't take him long. I don't know how many shows, but probably no more than 10 shows, I imagine, before, before he's, you know, put away those notes and it's just like, you know, eating it up, just, you know, got the crowd eating out of his hands, you know. I remember David Henschel, so. the producer on that album, said on the, on the Trick of the Tail, said the that tail. he didn't need really any prodding to go, you know, I think he was just saying, you know, playing nice at, you know, all this stuff is that he didn't really need any prodding to be a front man. You know, he, he already well, had and, the charisma and everything about him. Yeah, right. He kind of, you know, he played, like he played the artful Dodger in, in school. Right. But he, I think also he just, he really loves the drums. And he, he had a hard time, I think, conceiving of how that could happen. How he, how he could still be the drummer and the singer, you know, the right. lead singer. And it was hard for him to kind of conceive of how that could happen. Right. And I am curious know, how mean, they produced. I would like to have seen how they, how Hugh and him produced this because, you know, he's such a drummer. And yet, a lot of these yeah. songs written in piano. Did he lay down piano tracks and then play he drums did. over them? Did he play drum tracks because he already knew oh, the song right. so well and then put everything right. else with it? You know? Yeah. Well, interesting. you know, Padgham, yeah, Padgham did say that he, he came in, at least with the Face Value album, that he came in with all of these songs already written. And you know, just the demo, like in the air tonight, is per- essentially his demo that he made at home. Uh, they dumped his like four track demo onto you know a twenty four track tape at, in, at the studio. But you know, instead of trying to recreate it, they they just kept trying and it couldn't get it. And they just like, well, let's just go with the demo, man. Because so you know, he's he 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 just had a way, right? And I I, I don't. I don't know if he realized it until, you know, maybe Trick of the Tail and when he really started. I was trying to find out where they recorded this album and and there's like four places that's given credit, you know, including the farm where Genesis basically creates their songs. So, and 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 Townhouse, which is where Hugh Pageant came out of and CBS Studios, which I imagine, I bet that's where they recorded some of the horns and stuff like that. So... I, but yeah, I, I know. I know. It's face value. They went out to L.A. to record some of the horns. So yeah, but this was all in in in, a, in London. It looked like, for the most part. So, but well, he squeezed he it. He squeezed it in between. You know, they did Abacab, and and then there were three. They did that tour, and then then did this, and then he went up right on and did uh, the Genesis album with Mama and all that on it. So yeah. all that was just. Yeah. Golly, imagine how busy. What a creative period. Yeah, creative periods, man. He just, yeah. uh, you know, no wonder, no wonder his, his, uh, he, his, his wife left him <laughs> because he was just on the road all the time, you know? And I mean, I really believe that's true. It's, yeah. it's just, it was, a, you know, they had new baby and stuff and, you right. know, uh, you know, I mean, did you, I don't know if you saw Bohemian Rhapsody, you know, the, the queen, uh, Freddie Mercury, Freddie Mercury movie, but I mean, it was this, it was a thing where these people were on the road so often that they couldn't maintain, you know, stable relationships with a, a partner. Right. You know, it was a no. thing. And yeah. I guess uh, I think I think Paul, especially, Paul especially, and Linda McCartney got lucky. Spe- and especially, well, together. especially, yeah. Plus, he, you know, his fame when he was doing all that touring and everything. Paul McCartney. Linda wasn't there, so you know. Oh right, they, they, before yeah, that's and right. they toured together and everything. Phil being a front man, you're talking about Freddie Mercury being a front guy. You know these guys that become these huge names on their own outside of the bands that they came up with. You know, it's that'd be hard to do. And their egos, you can't help yeah. but to have these egos about. Well, here I am. This is me. I'm the. You know, this is guy is one of the biggest pop stars in the world. So. Yeah, I, I can't yeah. imagine. Yeah, can't imagine. Well, uh, we're moving out of the I, I, Genesis. I, I, Phil Collins. Oh, what? Go ahead, Keith. Well, I, one more, just one last little thing okay. there. I, I, you know, that can be a, definitely a friction thing. I think with band people, but I, it seems like with these guys, you know, Phil and Tony Banks and Mike Rutherford, that they're they always were still uh, buddies. You know. Well, yeah. Um, as far as I can tell, as far as I can tell, they didn't. It wasn't a big falling out. I think that was because of Tony and, and Mike were just such strong, you know, writing, such a, such a such a strong writing force and everything. If they were going to do whatever they did, 
anyway. Yeah. And Phil and just... And Mike had Mike and the Mechanics, too, yeah. which was a pretty popular uh, venture. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then Tony, Tony just, you know, didn't need anything but his keyboards, really. Well, he had, <laughs> he had solo projects, too, but yeah. Yeah. He did, he did, but they didn't. They weren't so popular. But. Well, we're leaving that part anyway. of the world for a while. Yeah, what's next? And we're going somewhere completely, completely, com- oh, completely, completely different. <laughs> 2018, Bernice, this is a band that I found uh, on, ca- on uh, the radio, NPR. Uh, yeah. It was a, a hint, a hint. I, I didn't even hear it. It was a, an artist that I thought was really cool, said that they loved uh, Bernice. And I went out and got this album and I was like, oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. And so, uh, yeah, I'm excited about this one. This uh, is not a long album. My... It's short. It's a short, short little thing, but it is definitely different than anything we've done before. That's for sure. Yeah. And it's a super cool sound. And I just think a lot of people were going to, are going to like it. So hopefully you can join us uh, next time for uh, some Bernice, man, from Toronto. Anyway, yes, we love you guys. Time. Um, we do love you see, guys. He is Dell. And he is Keith. And we are Ron Joe, and we listen to cool albums, and we'll uh, see you next time, eh? Love you guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.